Why are the Bears so Jekyll and Hyde on offense, and is there hope for improvement? Well, yeah, I don't know if there's... I think it's all Jekyll. Not, there is no Hyde. I mean, or, well, which one's the good one, which one's the bad one? Jekyll or Hyde? I don't know. Oh, yeah, baby. Well, you didn't know either, so don't worry. <laughs> well, we realized that today on the show. You weren't sure who the hell no. is Jekyll or Hyde either. No. I don't know why. I mean, Jekyll just sounds meaner yeah. or bad. Or I don't know what you it is. Jekyll beats Hyde? I thought I, I didn't know, so I, I wasn't sure either way. I yes, was frozen we right out. away, the fact that I didn't know. I was waiting for Pete, and yeah. Pete gave me some kind of direction. I don't know if he was correct or not. Oh, no. When we were – so. He yes, said, was he right. was right, and yeah. we played it on the show today. Yeah. And while it was playing, Florio was literally laughing because he goes, Paul doesn't know no, either. I didn't. Paul I didn't. doesn't know either. So that's that. So that's we figured it out. I, I mean, know, these yeah. are the things you want deep dives here in Chris Sims on Button. We give you the good shit. We get right? exposed in many ways. <laughs> yes, we yes. really do. Got a good one today. We're going to break down some games. It's what the fuck happened Wednesday. Excuse my language, but not excuse it, okay? <laughs> and then Big Phil's coming on in a little yeah, while. We got while. him back in the fold. Yeah, I know. It's been a weird year. He's been busy some of these days. Of course, with COVID-19 and the pandemic, we're here at NBC at times, a little stressed with manpower, what control rooms to use, all those type of things. So finally, we got it together, and uh, we're going to – Pick his brain a little bit today. Yes, it's going to be fun just to dive into football for a couple hours and kind of kind of pull away from some of the other things happening. Yeah, and we've got four games we're really thinking about. Cool. Uh, Seattle, San Francisco, as promised uh, on Monday, we kind of hinted we we're going to spend more time with that. I think two areas uh, yeah. deserve it the most: DK Metcalf, right, and then that Seattle defense that's been so suspect. I mean, having three quarters where they they certainly look the part. So yeah. let's start offensively. And I think when we're going toward DK this week, we got to throw in that the week before against Arizona, uh, he wasn't targeted much. Only had a couple of catches, and he had by far his best day as a pro. He did. What happened with that offense right. as it relates to DK? Well, I, I mean, you know, we, we hit on it last week about that Seattle uh, Seattle Arizona football game and the fact that Seattle can't let anybody play them the way Arizona played them, which was a lot of man-to-man coverage, one-on-one matchups for DK Metcalf. If you let teams do that and you don't attack with DK Metcalf, you're letting them off the hook. You know, I sat here and watched this game and I was like, damn, I feel like, I felt like a proud papa. Because I was like, man, did they Seattle listen to, listen to the podcast this <laughs> week? This is kind of cool. But I, I doubt they listened to the podcast. I'm pretty sure they probably just watched the film and went, wait, how did, why did we let that happen? Russell Wilson probably kept him up at night a few times last week where he went, I can't believe I didn't throw him the ball more. And that's really all there was to it. It was, oh, wait, you're playing single safety, whether it's three deep zone or man-to-man, it still ends up being one-on-one. And they just, all day long, from the get-go, just went, oh, it's one-on-one? Forget it. We're going there. And they really emphasize that. Were they paying more attention to Lockett because of what Lockett did? No, they're not. And, you know, like San Francisco's not a real, like, big double this guy, put a two safeties over this guy. They really don't do that. Very rarely. I mean, even last year, there's only a handful of games and plays that I could really remember where I go, ooh, San Francisco got away from their basics here and tried to take away Tyree Kill in a big moment or whatever it was, right? But it was very few and far between. Um, I just think, you know, with the, way, with the way the 49ers play, it matched up to the thought of what Seattle wants to do. And then, hey, let's just start it off right where, you know, the, the, the jump off point, the first touchdown pass, right? Yeah. First touchdown pass. Hey, it's, it's all it is is a curl route to the left side. And San Francisco's playing three deep coverage. They blitz one guy off the edge. So it's blitz zone three match. Right, and like we, anybody who's listening to the podcast, three match, three zone in the NFL now is yes, it's a three deep zone, but when people come into your area, it becomes it's basically the man to man. Exactly, it's yeah. the basketball. That's the best way to describe it. I need to start using that. But that's basically what it is. He had three verticals on the right. It was a curl route to the left where they kind of matched up with him. And his rule is, I think, on this curl route, if you feel like the guy is matching up, then you almost kind of keep running inside and make it look like an in cut. He catches the ball. And, you know, again, what, what more can you say about the guy? He turns it on like he's running down Buda Baker on the interception right, right from the get-go. And there's the size, the agility, the pure speed of the person allows him to turn the corner and make plays that, again, I only think it's him, Tyree Kill, you know, DJ Moore, 
I mean, it's a very short few of receivers who turn the corner right there and score a touchdown. I think that was the impressive part. What, what's the adjustment that San Francisco should have made and really the lesson that other teams that are watching this yeah. um, should go to when they play Seattle? Because even if he's not the best receiver in the NFL, like you said, yeah, right. he's a problem. Yes. For every single defense, he's a massive problem. And it's clear in this game they were going to him. They targeted him 15 times, right. 12 catches. What's the adjustment they should have made at that point? Yeah, I think at, you know, at, at some point there, because it's six receptions for 102 yards Early. in the first half, yeah. right? And this is, to me, you know, again, this is more pro-Seattle conversation, but I think you have to throw in a handful of, you know, oh, it's second and eight, we're not sure what you're going to do, we might make it look like we're playing cover three. Oh, a safety dropped out, and now we got two guys over the top of DK Metcalf or whatever. Just to throw them some curveballs to know, oh, you think you're getting a one-on-one -on -one play or you think you're going to have a chance to hit him here, and it's not always going to be there. We might let, like fool you into it pre-snap that you think it's there, and then it's not. But that's the point of the day, Paul, and that should be the point of the Seattle Seahawks. They fed him until the defense said no more. So he gets six for 102. In the first half. First half, yeah. Second half starts, and I think San Francisco got the ball first. They punt to Seattle, and guess what happens? It's too deep over DK Metcalf every single play. Every single. And now, what, is, what, is, what does Seattle do to start the second half? All of a sudden, you know, the run game's working. Yeah. The run game's working. The run game. Yes. Because if, you know, TV or something would show, it's because now 49ers are in the, oh, shit, we're scared of DK Metcalf mode, mm -hmm. and we're going to drop back and play shell coverages from here on out because we know you're just going to go to the well if we leave them one-on-one. -on -one. And it changed the, it really ended the football game because now they're compromised and, ooh, we have to worry about DK Metcalf. And Seattle is big enough and smart enough and patient with the run as it is anyways, even for a very good passing football team, to where they just said, fine, go ahead, you take it, we'll smash mouth you there, and then we'll continue just to nickel and dime you. And then, of course, they had the lead, too, and they didn't have to take many chances after that. How does Lockett and what he can do if you leave him alone as well yeah. and Wilson's running ability, how does that affect what the what the proper response can be oh, to DK's talent? Yeah, that's what I mean. They're going to be able to use Lockett in so many different ways because now, okay, yeah, we got two guys on DK. Wait, we want to worry about Russell scrambling. We'd like to leave one guy to watch him sometimes. And oh man, now it's DK. I mean, now it's Tyler Lockett. And gosh, we don't feel great about playing one on one with him either. And yeah, I think it's going to lead to a lot of more of. DK clearing things out and Lockett being wide open underneath, especially as good as they are as throwing the ball deep and Russell is at throwing the football that way to where, yeah, I think you're just going to see, again, more and more favorable matchups that way towards him to answer your question. Right. You know, I don't think there's any way you can really double both unless it's just an occasional, this is out of nowhere, we're just trying to catch you, you know, off guard on the third and six. But you won't see it again for 30 snaps. Like yeah. I don't think you're going to be able to consistently do that against them because then you are going to be one person short on Russell Wilson running and doing all the things that he can do too. It's almost like uh, watching last week and how little he was involved and watching how often they went to him, how often he came through this week. Right. Like Wilson and Pete Carroll almost learning just as we are with wide eyes like, oh my God, this guy's he, he's even better than we thought he was. He, he, he's, he's a game – he is – he can be Terrell Owens. He can be that guy. He's that type of specimen. You could tell he loves football. Of course, he takes care of his body. Yep. He's chiseled out of granite. And uh, they continue, you know, other than that one game against Arizona, find ways to get him the ball. And Russell's great. I mean, Russell, other than that game, I mean, when it's been one-on-one -on -one or anything like that, he does feed him the ball, and I hope that continues. Hopefully that Arizona Cardinal game taught them the lesson they needed to learn there. Talked about the first touchdown, and we had a little uh, visual there for it as well, right. for those of you watching. Second touchdown was, was a highly contested catch. Oh, my gosh. I mean, the slant to the right, you know, first off, you know, throughout the game, him catching the ball in tight windows and taking shots, I mean – he catches balls, and people hit him in the head, and you go, oh, man, I hope he's okay. And the guy that hit him's hurt, <laughs> and he's not. And he's just such a big body to, again, that's where they got you by the balls down there. Sorry for that lack of a better way to explain it. But because when he gets in certain spots, I mean, what do you play for? Do you play for the jump ball fade? Hmm. 
do you play for? It's almost like you would have to you would have to drop your linebackers into that into that space where Wilson is throwing the quick slant because you can't count on any corner. No. To, to really cover him and body him up, even if it looks like he's covered. No, there's no way. You're exactly right. It would have to be, hey, corner, you play outside leverage, right? And then we'll have some people to drop off underneath to what you're saying to where now, now okay, you don't have to worry about the slant route or anything like that on the ins- inside breaking route, and you shouldn't be affected that way. And I just wanted to take one more look just to make sure I got this right with this play, but I think I'm good here. This is the, um, the You know, touchdown. hey, Chris has got to look at his damn plays, all right? That's what Chris <laughs> Which does. Which one are you looking at? Oh, no, I'm good. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything on that play specifically. But, um, yeah, I mean, again, DK Metcalf, Seattle, I think they have something there. I think they have to play that. It's their biggest power you know, or big chip they have as far as their offense is concerned. We know Russell's the best player. Yes, DK's not far behind. And they need to play to the, we're going to stress you out with number three and number 14 all day long until you take it away, and then we'll go off of that. And that is, you know, that's got a chance to be a really special mismatch. It's where I look at, it's almost like, you know, the thing that goes through my head is like Brady and Gronk and things like that. Where it's just, hey, we're going to feed them until yeah. you do something so crazy that you got to take them away, and now we'll scorch you with, you know, Edelman and those kind of guys, and you know, we'll see where it goes. Okay, so DK's up. He's been a story really this entire season. He's either been good or great. Last week at Arizona wasn't much of a factor. We right. talked about that defensively, though, for the Seahawks, as the offense had been they've been scoring in the 30s. They averaged 34 points per game. Yep. We've been imploring the defense or waiting. Can they go from terrible to okay? And if they can start to make that journey, this team has a real chance. For three quarters against the Niners, we finally saw that. It was a lot different group in terms of production. Yeah. What did they do differently? Well, I think the biggest thing they did is a little bit of like what we would always say. They called the bluff of the 49ers in certain situations and certain formations. When they felt like it was maybe a run-pass type of down, they went in and said, we're stopping the run, all out. Go ahead, maybe you'll drop back and pass, and maybe somebody will be open, but we're going to make sure... Was that new for them? The results were new, but was that that philosophy? I I think the fact that they attacked it the way they did, and then with no Debo Samuel in the game, it emboldened them a little bit more to go, let's take a chance or two more maybe than we usually have. You know, let's let's get five and six man fronts and maybe blitz a safety off the edge to give us one extra guy and do those type of things. So they were really good at that. And then I'll say the other thing they were really good at too was within getting in those sets. And if they did keep it for a boot or a play action, it, it seemed like they had a really good feel of, okay, wait, I'm Bobby Wagner, I'm the middle linebacker. Oh, they faked to my left. Oh, man, now it's the boot coming out to the right. He was always looking up the right spot or the guy coming across. He was much better, wasn't he? He he definitely was. I mean, he was all over the field in that game. I mean, for the way he plays still at his age is is really phenomenal because he's still one of the – he's in the combo for one of the best middle linebackers in football still. But I think with that – and, yeah, they kind of called the bluff on just the 49ers drop back pass game. I think they said, we're stopping the run. Mm -hmm. We're going to – Stop over the middle, play action, boots when Shanahan's so cool that way. And, you know, the game got away from San Francisco. San Francisco realized it early on. They realized early on, I think, that, oh, the Seahawks are going to play all out to stop the run. They spread the field out early and had success. You know, moved the ball down the field the first drive and then kind of got knocked out of field goal position, had to punt the ball. Second drive again, moved the ball down the field. You know, nothing special that I could sit here and go, oh, wow, this was amazing. But just some good, efficient offense. And then he throws the interception on a horrible pass to George Kittle. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that to me, you know, was their chance to kind of get a cushion early in the game or gain some momentum. But... You know the old story. I mean, it just always seems like, hey, yeah, yeah, you controlled the game for two, two, you know, most of the first quarter, and then you have nothing to say for it. Uh, that usually means it's going to be an avalanche the other way at some point, and that's kind of the way it played out. And uh, I really think that was the general theme of the day, uh, as far as them and what they did to the the 49ers offense, crowding the line of scrimmage. They took a few chances, some calculated chances in coverage, like I said, and. You know, I think, I think really that, that was more of it than anything else. We look at the totality of the game, and after Jimmy Garoppolo went out, now it makes total sense. I mean, he's out for an extended period of time with a new high ankle sprain. But Mullins came in and had a lot of success. Game was kind of out of reach at that point, so I don't want to read too much into that. Yeah. 
But at the end of this, of this little sample size, you have three quarters where the Seattle defense is really good. You have right. one quarter where they weren't. And if a Seahawk fan talked to you and said, that was awesome, that was a defense I've been waiting for in yeah. this game, one game aberration, or do you think they've turned the corner and there's real hope? I want to say that they've turned the corner and there's a little more hope than one game aberration. Why I that? do. And not necessarily that I think it's going to be like so much better. You've turned the corner and now you're going to be... But again, it only has to be okay. Just a little bit. You're right. It has to go from like 31 or 32 to like 22 Low or 21 20s. and we'd yes. be fine. Huge win. You're going to go, okay, that's a totally different football team. But, you know, other than the Cardinals football game... The one thing I'll say about Seattle, and I think you and I have had this conversation, is they force the issue. Mm -hmm. They force the issue. And I do like that aspect of them. They're not going to die slow deaths. They're going to attack. They might give up a few plays, but like we've talked about, that gets Russell Wilson on the field. I think they realize, too, that that's the way they have to play. I think they went into the Arizona game and tried to play a little bit like, hey, let's bend, don't break. We'll score touchdowns and do that. And they just kept bending and bending and then breaking. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's their best style of football. You know, so th that, to me, when they get Jamal Adams and Carlos Dunlap back, that is going to help their football team. Big time. It is. Quentin Dunbar, him being back now, consecutive healthy games in a row and things like that, he helps them to take a chance and coverage and man-to-man -man every now and then. So... I do. I think it's going in the right direction. Jordan Brooks back healthy at middle linebacker. When they get healthy in their def you know, when they're healthy in their base defense, he's a difference maker that way. Um, you know, and then I'll go to this too. And this is the, the last thing and where I'll never be sold on the Seahawks all the way. You know, I, I do feel like Seattle had a good feel of Shanahan's drop back pass game. And you know, again, just seemed like they were all over some of the concepts that way. Yeah. And you know, one thing I'll always say with Shanahan and Jimmy Garoppolo that I don't love is they don't attack outside the numbers enough. And Seattle gives you those type of throws, just as San Francisco gave Seattle those type of throws because it's the same scheme. Why is that? Because he's so good between the hashes. Is it, is it Kyle's scheme or is it a lack of belief that that's something he can do? I think it's kind of both. I think, it's, I think Kyle is a, a magic man in getting people open over in the middle of the foot field there. And I yeah. think, you know, new school football has gotten away from the – my dad's era, your era of, hey, he's one-on-one -on -one outside and he's Drive seven it, yards yeah, off. Yeah. Let's just throw an out route. They're right. giving it to us. The new school football has gotten away from that, from, uh, from that aspect, except a handful of teams. Seattle is one of those that's not. Right. They're old school. They will do that. Oh, you're giving us the 15 yards we'll back? It. We'll throw it. And that's another thing that, you know, they drop the ball on, in my opinion, to yeah. where, you know, you got to take advantage of it's one-on-one -on -one out there. They can't cover Ayuk or Kendrick Bourne. They're not great coverage guys that way. But there was nothing there to attack that, that part of the, the field. Yeah, he had less than 100 yards passing in his time in. Yeah. Garoppolo did. Yeah. And I've never watched him throw the ball over the middle or deep and, and say, boy, I bet he can't drive the ball outside the numbers. I, it's, it's not a, an arm strength thing. No, I mean, he can do it. It's just he's not great at it. Must not be. No, he's not. He can't drive the ball always and those type of throws into tight windows. Yeah. You know, it's one thing if the guy's off and he gets to kind of throw it in rhythm and throw it out there. But if it's a little tight or hairy, he's just not yeah. enough of a pinpoint thrower and a, and a driver of the football that way to where... You, know, you could feel the same way about Mahomes or Big Ben and a tight throw. You go, oh, they'll just drive a rifle right through the guy's chest. Right. He doesn't do that, and I think that would probably make coaches a little antsy too. Showed up there. Yeah. So Seattle beating the, the 49ers 37-27. to 27. Good focus there on DK and also the uh, Seattle defense, much better than it had been. Moving on now to the Dolphins knocking off the Rams. Ooh, to his first start, 28-17. to 17. And this one is noteworthy for me. Not just because of Tua's first start, and he, he was fine. They didn't really need him to be anything else to win this game. Right. The numbers are phenomenal in favor of the Rams. Yes. How they dominated this game right. outside of the Jared Goff turnovers, which were huge. Good way to start here. We'll start here with a question from Hagerstown. Uh, this person asks, I'd love to know what the Dolphins' defense did to make Goff play so poorly. Yes. Well, it was a psychological warfare, first off, of Brian Flores and toying with McVay and Goff with the blitz package. Uh, I mean, they exposed that to a degree. They showed that the Rams aren't sure quite how to pick up or what they should do with certain type of blitzes. I mean, you saw that. You watched the yes, game back too, yeah. right? I mean, there was a lot of issues there. Yeah. And, you know, again, 
Yes, could McVay help out more? Certainly, sure. But the other aspect is, I mean, and we're going to get into some of the specifics here, with some of these, you know, all-out pressures, or it's a six- or seven-man blitz, and I know two men drop out, but, you know, it's too late at that point. There's seven guys at the line of scrimmage. Yeah, two guys dropped out, but they took a step or two as they were going to blitz, so now that guard and center are ready to block them. They can't adjust quick enough to now block the other guys who are blitzing to readjust to the guys who dropped yes. off. That's yeah. very hard. That's a New England. They've mastered that. Brian Flores is as good as anybody there is in the sport. Yep. But golf has played too much football to not know, wait, okay, yeah, usually they drop out. Great, great. But there's guys on the edge that, you know, your own line's just not going to be able to adjust to quickly enough. There's two things, and we're getting into both of those. Yes. One, you know, first the blitzes, and we'll hit on all that. The other thing that I think is just a, a fascinating aspect of the football game is Flores did have a beat on the offense. There's no doubt about that. And whether that goes back to Super Bowl 53, I'm sure a little of it does, yes. But, you know, they... Like the Giants did a few weeks ago, because the Giants have a coordinator. Uh, yep, that's right, from New England, who understands that. Where, you know, five and six men line of scrimmage. You know, it's the way that people like to play the Rams, especially if you got some big people in some cover corners. And they went seven uh, quite a bit, too. Seven five, quite six, a bit, too. Seven, yeah. No doubt about it. But these ones are more about stopping, like, the speed sweep aspect of okay. their offense, right? If you want to know what happened to Goff and McVay and the Rams, well, the first thing is, as we always talk about, they rely on the run game. The run game is the number one thing that makes the Rams offense go. And they want to stress you with that because then it's the speed sweeps, the fake speed sweeps, the play actions, the fake speed sweep, fake, fake play action screen you know, to the running back, to the tight end, to the faking guy we did on the speed sweep. I mean, they have it all. So once they get you going with the running game, it's just like, oh, which way did he go? Which way did he go? Which way did he go? Well, the Dolphins have big people up front mm -hmm. who can two-gap. That's an, the first thing I would say. Like Christian Wilkins and Raekwon Davis can hold up any deep offensive lineman in football and just go, you're not moving, I'm staying there, and wherever this ball goes, I'm going to throw you opposite, and I'm going to be old there. Old school. They're old school, mm -hmm. and that's, that's New England too. So they have that aspect, first of all, that gives them a little cheat code, right? We got one guy to play two gaps, and then we got another guy to play two gaps. So that really helps them out and gives them the advantage there. But the other thing just about the stopping the speed sweep, you know, you talked about the, the guys at the line of scrimmage and all that. They got into some formations where it's a five-man bare front, right? Mm -hmm. Three guys over the two guards in the center, and then outside linebacker slash defense ends on the outside edge of the tight end and the tackle, right? All those things. But then they would bring another guy down. And you, at a defensive lineman, you don't really see a lot. It's six across, but there's two guys weak, or should I say two guys away from Robert Woods. Mm. And that was the first thing that jumped out to me. Ooh, they played some defenses where I don't really know what you would call this alignment. This is mm. a special game plan alignment, but it's to stop the speed sweep action. So the, the, the significance of that being away from Robert Woods is they're in place because They had of those some tells in their offense, and they, mu they also went, when they do speed sweep or fake speed sweep, it's almost huh. always Robert Woods. Yeah. So let's play that. And they're right. I think you could. I'm, I wouldn't know the numbers, but I think you know Pete might be able to look it up before we end the conversation. I bet you he's got significantly more carries than a Cooper Cup or any other receiver right. in speed sweeps in the year. Yeah. So that's to be the first thing I would say. You took that part away, and then it became all the blitzes. Yes, and right? with the blitzes. Yes, yeah, let's hit them. Sure, you can can locate what you're looking for there. I don't want to boil it down to just two plays because there were a lot of plays that mattered. But two of the signature plays for their defense, yeah. they, they had the fumble return for touchdown. Right. And Jared Goff had an interception there in the second quarter yeah. as well. So in the second quarter, that's yeah. really when the Miami Blitz really started to win the game. It did. And w with the return for a touchdown, they rushed six, and the Rams blocked with only five. Right. In the interception I'm talking about, they rushed seven. The Rams protect with only six. So in both cases, they fooled them. They outnumbered them. Is that a McVay scheme thing that failed? Right. Is it the offensive line, or is it Goff not recognizing it? Hey, we're outnumbered. I got to do something different. Yeah, no, it's not the offensive line. So okay, I'll so say that we right roll off the that bat. Out. That's it's it's not them. It is more about the McVay Goff combination. Now the first interception, right? The tip, the you know Wilkins gets it. It was a great blitz. 
Yes, that's the first. That was great because the D lineman just dropped right into that right. zone. Yeah. And it, it did what you're talking about. So they're going to bring those blitzers, right? They show a six man pressure, mm -hmm. but two people popped out. Right. But they don't pop out like right away, mm -hmm. as we talked about. They kind of like attack the offensive lineman at first. So he has to stay there and go, wait, I think he's coming. Yeah. And then it's too late for him to help out or readjust anywhere. Yeah. So they really, even though it's a four man pressure, mm -hmm. It was still like a, it played like a six yeah. man pressure, yet they still got people back in yeah. zones. And then here's another thing where I bet you there was incredible telltale signs when you bring these type of blitzes that they throw the ball over the middle to one of these inside slants. And that's why Wilkins was sitting there. Yeah. They had a guy for each side. They had one guy for the slant on the other side, and they had him for that slant on that side. That's true. So they were playing that all the way. I, yeah. At least that would be my thought there. Yeah. So that's the first interception. That's a clever blitz that won. The other two that right. I brought up were just flat out outnumbering the yes. protection by one each time. And I think when people watch that and they see the highlights over and over, one of the questions has to be, is that Jared Goff's fault? Yes. It is. And how is it? Well, so here, the, the, the strip sack fumble, right, for what, what was that, 78-yard uh, fumble forever. return, right? Yeah, yeah forever. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, it's an all-out look, like you mentioned. Yep. Okay? They have mainly, up to that point, this is where the genius is, and this is where I go psychological warfare right here. To this point, all these blitzes have been the ones we've talked about on the interception. Right. We dropped two out. We dropped two out. Yeah, we're blitzing. Oh, no, we dropped two out. This now he calls, let's bring it. Mm -hmm. They're probably going to expect us to be dropping out. Now, okay, still within that, even though on those other ones they dropped out, they still couldn't block the guy off the edge because of what we talked about. The guys who dropped out still stress those offensive linemen. So I don't know why Goff, even though, why he still would think he's protected whether they drop or not. There's a guy way off the edge who is clearly in a blitz look, mm -hmm. and you haven't been able to pick him up all day long, whether right. they drop or blitz either way. So he, he should assume they're all coming. He doesn't even, he has no clue the guy's there. Mm -hmm. And that's where I'm just like, what? This is what? You're five for him? He's been to the Super Bowl? Like, I just, I don't even understand how that happened. So, you know... Either way, he should have had a clue, and yep. he didn't. And he had to be wary, just from the other plays we talked about where they dropped out, mm -hmm. to go, okay, yeah, they still only rushed four, but one guy was free every time still. Yeah. And that, to me, I don't understand you know, where the disconnect was there, either in his own brain or McVeigh taught him something or told him not to worry about it now because we think we got the drop figure. I don't know. Right. But either way, that was a huge mistake in the football game. They weren't playing good at that point. No. Right. You know? But they were making it happen ugly and kind of getting it in. And, of course, that made things uh, very stressful. So either way, he's in a bind. Because yes. if, if they're showing six and you know that your protection scheme only has five, whether they rush one or all six, right. you know what you have to block. Should he assume that all six are coming? Uh, when he has six blocking, should he assume all seven are coming? Yeah, well, you, 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 yeah, yes. I mean, it depends on the alignment. And then with these alignments, they showed like they were coming. There wasn't anything like... Oh, looks like it's a five-man blitz. Set hut. Oh no, they brought six. It wasn't like that. It was like, hey, here comes six. Yeah, we're six. It's six. It's six. We're coming. We're in the, the the sprinter stands. We're all coming, you know. So, and he has to again. He's seen some of these defense before to know that. Oh, if they drop him out, we're not going to be able to adjust on the fly and do that quickly enough. So. Yeah, I don't really... So he should have a plan to get rid of it quicker? He should have a plan, and usually they do. Yeah. Uh, but obviously, you know, Flores knew how to play their plan a little bit, and I think maybe he just had some mental gaffes that way as far as, you know, just not expecting those blitzers or not on his P's and Q's as far as the details of what needed to be done. Yeah. So I, I, I just have written down yeah. here the story is uh, Dolphins... Dolphins blitz second and third quarter dominates the day. Yeah, that's all there really is to it. I mean, they won the football game. That's why, I mean, we're, we're going to talk about two in a minute, but that will be a three-minute conversation because we right. don't have much to talk about. But Maybe you one know, minute. But they do that, all right? And then even within this, so now they've brought the all-out blitz mm -hmm. and done all of those type of things. You know, so now, so now what they're trying to do is the next thing they do is – now the Rams are not, they're scared of like, we're, we're not going to get, we're not going to get in any more empty sets. 
and just have five blockers. All right, let's keep a tight end always attached in case we get a six blocker. Let's keep a back in the backfield and then we can go seven blockers. But again, it didn't really matter because mm -hmm. there they were. Now they're going to bring the all out blitz and let's just go to Goff's second interception. Yeah. Again, holds the ball like he thinks he's protected. Right. And yeah, they have. On this one, it's a six-man protection. I'm sorry here. It's five linemen, and right. the back is in the backfield. This is where they outnumbered him seven to six. They outnumbered him. Yeah. And he still had no urgency here. And I think, you know, again, that was interesting, too. That was the first time they kind of brought that type of blitz. So there they brought seven. Yeah. They brought one yes. more, like you were yeah. saying. Yeah. And it was a cool way in which they did it, and it stressed Goff's and McVeigh's pass protection rules to where, again, this was another inkling where I went, oh, wait, they know they're going to slide this way. Mm -hmm. They're going to slide to the right. All right, so just if you're in the shotgun, and everybody's listening, you're in the shotgun, and your left guard, the center, the right guard, and the right tackle are all going to slide to the right. The left tackle is going to take the defense to end over him, and now the back has to take one blitzer off that edge, whoever it is. Well, Miami brought two. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, you can't, you can't get them both. Right. And, again, Goff, he just kind of throws the ball, like, nonchalantly and gets hit as he's throwing. Yeah. And the ball pops in the air and intercepts. Like, he didn't know he was outnumbered. Right. Which I just am like, I don't understand. But then that's where they really had them from the, ga from the rest of the game. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to your point where... I think you're answering the question yeah. when people watch, like, why does this keep happening? They're right. outnumbered by one each time. Who should know this? Who should make up for it? And right. it sounds like it's golf. It is. It is. It's definitely golf. I mean, there, there's no doubt about that. It's a good game plan. And, you know, overall, again, it was the second week in a row where we saw a team take away, you know, the boots, the screens... All the little McVeigh tricks, yeah, those were taken away, and then it's just like, okay, can now Goff beat you with the meat and potatoes part of the offense? And I still think that's a very real question. Clearly, no. Miami number one scoring defense in the league, so they they are to be dealt with. Wow, uh, the rest of the and way. they get another one later, you know, with another turnover, another turnover yeah. later with the tight end blocking the defense end now because again, the Rams are flustered with the blitz, Clearly. and they don't know what to do. Yeah, so now let's keep seven in. I'm in shotgun, tight end, you stay in, you knew that running was back, you stay yeah. in. But the problem was there now, too, is they got a matchup of a defense end on a tight end. Yeah. And he got home and caused another fumble. Right. And, you know, so a great job by Flores. It's, it's interesting, thinking back to what we talked about with Seattle and the adjustment for DK's great first half. Hey, we're going to play cover two and sit back. It was the wrong adjustment. And you knew that the Rams at some point were going to be like, Okay, we're going to leave more people in, and, and that, that adjustment wasn't right. It, well, it was. It took too long. You yeah. know, they, they lost control of the game before they made the right adjustment, Right, and uh, it, it cost them the football game. And, hey, listen, McVay got whooped, the O-line got whooped, and Goff was seriously flustered, and he threw two interceptions, and he should have thrown five. I mean, there's three others. At least four. At yeah. least four. Yeah. I mean, yes, at least four. He had two others that were in the chest of guys. I mean, one was a pick six. So... You know, again, that's why I still have that question about that Rams football team because when teams take away their run, ooh, yeah. do, they, do they look like a different team altogether? It's crazy how a quarterback can have 35 completions, throw for 355, and have you know, probably looked as bad as he has looked yes. uh, in, in a long, long time, yeah. maybe ever in the NFL. Right. The other quarterback was Tua. Uh, let's look at where Tua currently is in the Offensive Rookie of the Year odds. <laughs> offensive Rookie of the Year odds provided by our partners at Points Bet Sportsbook. What do you think here? Burrow and Herbert kind of a two-man race right now? I think so. So I it don't. says Burrow plus 100 and Herbert plus 105. Yeah. It's awfully tight. Yeah, that's tight. Who's well, your guy? They're, bo they're both amazing right now. I'm probably more amazed with Burrow. Yeah. It's not, and that's like really saying something because Herb Herbert, as you know, we've had a few podcasts here lately where I'm drooling over him too. Um, but I like those top three there. I mean, Justin Jefferson clearly way farther behind than the top two, but he is phenomenal. And, I, I mean, I, I'm shocked they already put Tua over Chase Claypool. How did that happen? I wouldn't, yeah, he's, he's plus 1,800. I would Claypool worry about that one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, Justin we'll Jefferson see. killed me in fantasy this week. Right? Oh. Yeah, just, just crushed me. I bet. I, well, you know who really killed you? Who's that? Dalvin Cook. You yes, know, the fact that he kept yes, he running for 10 oh yards at a time. They said, right? hey, the hell with this uh, Justin Jefferson throwing the ball. 
Are you, are you texting the old man? No, I was looking just to make sure um, that nothing happened here, but I think we're good. Okay, yeah. so it was nice of you to say that you, you were kind of leaning toward Joe Burrow over Justin Herbert here because right. it leads into our next game. Well, we got to hit Tua just real quick about it, though. I, I, I thought that was quick enough. Oh, that was quick enough? <laughs> well, Tua looked good, though. I do want to say that a quick release, great feet, okay? Yep. I will say that he didn't have to do anything. No. He only made two throws. The yep. rest was really just BS. Throws the one touchdown pass to tied at seven. Right. And the defense scores, special team score. Throw up two scores before he even touches it. it and you're right. And then he has to it's throw perfect. maybe one comeback to his right. And yep. everything else was other than that was a screen or a swing swing pass and all that. So we'll see. Give him Again, a passing grade. Yeah, yeah. I mean a passing grade. It's hard to really evaluate him in that. I will say in the first turnover, right when he gets the strip sack fumble, I don't know what the hell he was doing there. Yeah. You know nobody was open, but then he just started running like a chicken with his head cut off. Yeah. And he was about to throw the ball to somebody. Yeah. And it looked like he was about to throw an interception. Yeah. You know, but other than that, everything was pretty clean. But let's see. You know, yeah. I need to see a little more evidence before I go, okay, he's in Burrow or Justin Herbert's class. Yeah. Not quite there yet. Ten seconds or less, the AFC East right now. Do you like the Dolphins or the Bills better? I still am going to go with the Bills. Okay. I am. i got to see more from Tua yep. to, to just give them the, the, the lead there. Fair enough. All right. I, pro I promise the Joe Burrow talk coming up next. Bengals 31, Titans 20. And th I'm excited that we chose this game because yeah. I've been kind of aware and seeing the highlights of Burrow playing well and like, Oh, at some point here on the podcast, we're going to dive into him. Yeah. I can spend a couple hours watching him. So, right. so thanks for green lighting this one. I got to watch him. Uh, really, really fun. I mean, he's, he's playing even better than I thought he would be. Right. You know, looking back to what you thought of him in the draft, any aspect of his game uh, you think differently about him? Uh, probably more positive, but it can be more negative after watching him through this part I, of the season. You know, I, I can't. I think, you know, I, I've vocalized a little of my concerns with him as far as the deep ball and the power throws. Yep. But he's been better than, with that as of late. You know, we talked a little bit about his mechanics last week. He's kind of adjusted that to a degree. Everything else... You know, is what I saw in mm -hmm. college. Not to say I thought it was going to look like this yeah. right away. Right. But the, the, but he set the template to where when I think he might be able to be this type of player in the NFL, and he's just he's off the charts good. Yeah. I, for me, the the plays he makes, the poise, the decision making, the accuracy. You know, and then you know, as we've had this conversation a lot, when nothing's there, nobody's open, ooh, it's bad pass protection, he still seems to make something happen a lot of times. Yes. And that's where he's special. Yeah, he's able to, to be unsure for a moment, and then whether it's moving or just kind of kind of reshuffling a little bit, he's able to set up and find the right thing to do. Yep. After watching him, I went back through my notes talking to people during the draft, and right. my favorite quote about him came from an offensive coordinator who said, I wish there was some number that charted a tangible way to a quarterback going to the right place with the ball based off the defense. Right. Like, I wish I knew how often he was going where the ball was supposed to go because it seems like it's every time. And now six months later, you kind of see it playing out that way. It, it, it is very true. I mean, he doesn't really mess up plays or ever put them in the wrong play when he is controlling the line of scrimmage and doing it. So, one, he always goes to the right place with the football. And how do you go to the right place with the football? By with what the defense tells you to do that you're taught on certain defenses or in he's always does the right thing there let alone when they do give him the green light to call his own play at the line of scrimmage or check into the right play he knows what to check to he knows the proper play to go ooh this play is going to stress out this coverage so that's the first thing he does deadly let alone then the physical aspects to execute that after that that really make him tough to defend let's uh let's really look at a couple of plays yeah. here early a 24 yard pass to T Higgins it was a third and five remember he was rolling out to his right Looked like he was going to get sacked. Then it looked like when he threw it on, just throwing it away. Yep. And it turned out he had some pinpoint placement on putting that one near the sideline. Ended up being a 24-yard gain. Yeah. And, you know, up until that point, it was really just, hey, the Titans, they're better than us. we got to make shift O-line. Let's throw the ball short. Joe, you make quick yep. decisions. Let's not let their defensive line ruin the game against our inexperienced, you know, new guys we got starting on the offensive line. But – this play exemplifies what you're talking about. You know, it's another play where, yeah, he's got pressure. It's third and five. Nobody's open. Now he's running to the right because, hey, not that he had, like, immediate pressure, but, okay, I got the ball, one, two. Is anybody open? Nope. All right, let me get out and try to make something happen, right? And we're going to talk about Daniel Jones. He needs to learn that. Yeah. But, 
But so he does that, and then he goes out to the right, and yes, it's T. Higgins one on one with Jonathan Joseph. And this is why you have to be careful about playing one on one against the Bengals, because they have big receivers who will moss you, mm. and he will throw it up in the perfect spot, whether it's him. Tate, A.J. Green, they're all 6'2", 6'3", 6'5", and, and, and Boyd 6'2". So they can do that to you. But there he is running to the right, and the ability to recognize, wait, it's one-on-one. -on -one. Let me take a chance here. This is not the stupidest time to take a chance. And Jonathan Joseph wasn't really looking at the ball. Right. So he makes See that, that type. Right. Yeah. He makes the type of throw. And then just throws... You know, I don't want to say like an unbelievable ball, but just to be running as fast as he is to the right and then still put it up on a touch pass to where really it was like either his guy gets it or nobody does. Mm -hmm. That's where I went back to our Monday conversation where I go, it's luck. Right? It's luck. Yeah. It's luck. It's luck. Wait, no, I've said it's luck 50 times in a row. It's not luck anymore. Maybe in November it's, it's not luck. It's yeah. not. It's not. And that, that was just an amazing play. Uh, and he's got some little connection going with T. Higgins. Nice They're on one, the same yeah. page. And so so that, that's him making plays, uh, right decision, good placement, on the move outside of the pocket. 21-yard pass to Higgins on fourth and five oh. where he stayed inside the pocket. Where I, To me, it's even more impressive because he, for a moment, wasn't sure. He was flustered, looked like he might run, he might throw it away, he might not. He, okay, I'm, I'm going to gather myself right. and throws a 20-yard in route. Yeah, I mean... And that, that kind of poise inside the pocket is a really tough thing to do. It is, especially fourth and five, like you're saying. Right? And, 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 you know, again, it's just another example of, you know, he messed up, the defense won, whatever you want to say here, he still made it happen. And, yeah, you said it, it's fourth and five, 42-yard line. It's a three-man rush. But they're playing man coverage with two guys on the inside looking for crossers because they don't want their guys that are playing man to get picked, right? So they got two extra guys. They got a single safety deep. It's man coverage. And they got two extra free guys in the middle to, yes, we're not going to get picked over the middle so you can get a six-yard completion and get the first down. Now, the, the, the thing is where Burrow was wrong here, from the get-go, it should have been, wait, it's man-to-man -man single safety. My routes in the middle of the field here aren't good for that. Let me throw to T. Higgins or A.J. Green on go routes. That's where it should have gone from the very get-go. So I don't know if he got fooled by the coverage a mm. little bit, or even if he thought it was man, maybe he thought the guy who was, uh, it was Boyd, who kind of runs like a fake shallow cross and comes out, maybe he thought, it's man, they'll think we're running crossers, I'll play him. I right. think that's what he did. But then he went, oh, wait, there's two guys there, and that, I can't throw it. So now he's stuck. And now he's, okay, wait, let me pull the ball down. And you can see him look at the defensive line. And then he starts to dance around and make a play, mm -hmm. right? And he runs out to his right, and there's nobody, there's nobody. Just a little bit, though. Yes, not too much, right? Yeah. Not just like, I'm going to run to run. It was just to run to get out to, yeah. let me just buy a little time here and recalculate, time. right? Yeah. And he gets out just a little bit. And then he settles in, and he's okay. Let me see what's down there. Isn't that hard to? I mean, that, it that's is. A really it's hard where thing his to do. poise. He's yeah. Joe Cool. I yep. mean, he's the man that way. And T. Higgins, also credit to him, who's running a go route. Yes. Now he hasn't got the ball. He stops. He realizes, oh wait, my quarterback's over there, and he stops and runs across the field. Yeah. And Burrow throws him one of these like Patrick Mahomes. It's not a laser. It's those ones where he just. He kind of puts it in a spot and just yeah. lays it out there and goes, you go run and get it now. Right. And he uses his big body and get a first down, and that's where he has a real special feel. Great. I, th that's what I was going to bring up. Great yeah. feel, great, great touch. Feel. And after I watched that one, I was thinking, okay, I want to see them do that. I want to see them go to that area of the field more. And you, you can't recreate that half second of panic, run out to the right and set up. But, like, I, I, it gets me to the point. I thought most of their calls were 10 yards and less. Yes. Right over the middle quick out route no doubt i wanted to see them go more with a 20 yard middle of the field right and by the t time we got to the end of the game i realized they weren't going to no was no. that because y you think of that they were protecting the offensive line that was minus four or five guys or something about burrow no i think it's i don't think you know again is that burrow's strength of strengths him throwing lasers 20 25 yards not a laser field? but when you have that kind of feel you're right it he's still really good at it he is he's really good at it and i don't so that's why i would still go no i think it was a really good game plan by zach taylor yep. and going wait i'm not gonna let their defense win the game for them yeah. or our offense isn't gonna be the reason they win 
we're going to – he stayed very patient with the run game throughout the day, I mm-hmm. thought, even to a point where sometimes you're just like, man, don't run it. You're, you're nickel and diamond yeah. for five and six yeah, yards at a time. Keep throwing it. But he wasn't going to let them tee off. And I think between that, you know, and I do think ultimately it was about protecting the O-line. I do. And I think that, that's one of the last things I wrote in my, in my notes is just he did the right thing, Zach Taylor, as far as just overall game plan. And I thought that was really smart and really uh, – You know, the Titans have showed some, you know, inability to stop short passing game or teams that can pass the ball that way. That's one of the issues of their football team. Well, that was a fun watch. It was. Love watching the young quarterbacks do well. We've got quite a bit of that going on right now. Okay, quarterback Jeopardy is making an appearance now for four of the five questions. I'm saving the last question. Uh, for your pop here. So okay. this is a look at what's coming up on NBC this weekend. Pretty good lineup. 2.30 on Saturday, Breeders' Cup. 7.30, number one against number four, Clemson against Notre Dame. Sunday, NASCAR Cup Series Championship. That's at 3 o'clock. And then Football Night in America. Look at that game. Saints, Buccaneers, Breeze, Brady. That starts at 7 awesome. o'clock Sunday night. So as for quarterback Jeopardy, I'm thinking about Clemson and Notre Dame. So we have a Fighting Irish and Tiger-based QB Jeopardy. All right. Okay, okay. I like this. He, you get your mind in South Bend. I'm going, going to go in a little bit. Yep, going to both. Here we go. Okay, so we're going to go with four of the five here, and the last one, we'll see if the old man can get it because it has to do with him. Okay, for 100 points, let's go back to the 1979 draft. A certain team took a Notre Dame quarterback and a Clemson wide receiver. That combo went on to help this team win multiple the 49ers. Super Bowls. Okay, that's 49ers. All right, so that was, what was, that was Joe, and was that Dwight Clark? There you go. Right, okay. All right, 100 points. Thank you. Just like that, right Just in your like pocket. That. It's easy. 200. 2015, Notre Dame and Clemson also met unbeaten that year as well. Yep. With the Tigers winning in a rainstorm 24 22. Who were the starting quarterbacks in that game? All right, so Watson's won. Notre Dame. Watson's won. There you go. Deshaun Watson. And then I think it's Kaiser, there right? You, yeah, Deshaun Kaiser. It is Deshaun Kaiser. Two, two Deshauns, yeah. right? Yeah. I, know, I know I was chickened out just from that aspect. <laughs> I was like, it wasn't two Deshauns, was I, it? I yeah. had that written down as like a potential hint. That was a you. game, if I re- I mean, Notre Dame could have won that game that day, right? Yes, the, I, I mean, think they, I, I was, I think I called a game somewhere in the Ivy League. I was driving home listening. Notre Dame was down. They came back right. and they had it. They were on a drive. I think they had a late fumble, maybe. It's something like that. And I can't remember what it was. I remember thinking Notre Dame had control and somehow yes. Clemson won it at the end, but whatever. Okay. 300 points, two for two. All right. 2018 Cotton Bowl between Notre Dame and Clemson. Notre Dame had four pass catchers from that team drafted. Named three of them. Ooh, okay. Notre Dame had four pass catchers. So, dra- so all right. We're thinking so Miles Boykin, tight end. Right. There's one. Okay. Cole Komet. Yes. Um, Boykin into the Ravens, commit to the Bears. Well, then we got Claypool. Claypool to the Steelers. That's But great. hold on. Well, who, you want to go with four? I do want to go for I don't think you're going to get it. No? I don't think you're going to get okay. it. Okay. He rec- he's a receiver, though. He's a tight end. And Ooh. while you're thinking about it, Boykin and Claypool in the same game this past weekend both had receiving uh, touchdowns. Right, you're right. You're right. Okay, Wait, so he was another tight end. Another tight end. I, I mean, it's just, I know i got to know this, too. This is going to be annoying. I mean, yes. I've messed this up. Who is it? Pete's Pete Stockin. Go ahead, Pete. Uh, 2015 ended on a failed two-point Oh, conversion. that's what it was. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. So you, you, you have this question. Yeah. You nailed the 100, 200, 300, but you want the fourth pass catcher, Alizé Mack. Oh, Alizé, Alizé Mack. Mack drafted Wait, where by is, the Saints. He's on the, is he still there in your practice squad? Pete? Yeah, I'm not sure. He'll, we'll come back to maybe it either way. Check the fine print yeah, on that I've, one. I thought maybe Alizé might be able to hang in there for a little right? bit in the NFL. He has a little talent. Pete just said something. Pete, did you say he's, yes? He's checking. Yeah, he's okay. checking. He's, so he's go efforting. ahead. So we okay. got one more here? 400. Yeah. T. Higgins, we've talked about him. Nice mm-hmm. start to his NFL career in Cincinnati. But another receiver from the 2018 Clemson National Championship team scored an NFL touchdown this weekend. Who is he? Oh, man. Okay, so you had T. Higgins yeah. on that team. And this other player was also a very good player. And he had a receiving touchdown this past weekend. Gosh, damn. It's going to be somebody stupid, ridiculous, easy. And I'm Mike Williams. No. No, he wasn't on 18's team. Damn, Mike Williams wasn't there. Yeah. And I'm being told Alizé Mack was cut by the Chiefs. He was cut by the Chiefs. Earlier this season. Wow, wait. What the hell? Who am I missing here? T. Higgins on one side, on the other. (sighs) Actually, in the slot. Oh. Did Hump? No. Did Humphreys? No. No? I mean, no. He was H-U, H-U, huh, was, was the right start. Hunter Renfro. Oh, damn. 
Hunter Renfro I would have got there. there. It took a while. Eventually yeah, got yeah. It. I knew there was somebody I was missing. I couldn't dial him up in my brain. Damn yeah. it. Three out of four. All right. It's good. Damn. It's really good. I should have got that. Yeah. Damn. Renfro, Renfro had a touchdown catch this week that was very he questionable. Uh, and big. It, did. it was big. big in the game. It was big in, in that the game. win against Cleveland. Yes, it was. Okay, so that's a start. That's right. four out of the five. And this is, you know, we, we were going to go Big Phil. Yeah. He, he's eventually going to be with us here. Oh, yeah, he's close. I think he's saying he's on right now. So he might. He's here. You want to give it to him? Big what? Phil. Hey, it's Paul. Can you hear me? Oh, I hear you well. God, I can't believe you didn't get Hunter Renfro. My God. I know. Uh, I, I know. Mean, I got raised the, well, this kid. I got the other ones, but yeah, I couldn't come yeah, up with it. The other ones are good. All right, good. Yeah, you heard that? Hey, Phil, question yes, sir, Question Paul. that's birthday and arm strength related. You just turned 65 this week. Happy birthday. Yeah. Happy belated. Right. Can you well, still throw you. at 65 yards? Uh, not even a chance. <laughs> I, I thought he was My arm yes. would go with it. My back would break. <laughs> and I probably would, you know, hurt one of my ankles. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly, yes. this is no kidding, Paul. Yeah. My right ankle still hurts. From throwing all off season with kids, you know, being a demonstrator, and I, I think I said, man, I think I, it's hurt like for real. But why does your right <laughs> ankle really hurt? Like, I mean, I know it hurts from this summer throwing, but like, what injury was it? Reggie oh, White I, I, or I is it Chris Dolman? In it, oh, is it, who was that against? Who'd you get it, get it uh, against? I got it against the Minnesota Vikings on Monday night. Right, I remember Chris Millard and, and I Dolman played and with them. it. Yeah, and it, it, it still hurts to this day, and. It was probably the only time in my career I got a sore arm because I, you know, in my right foot. Yeah. I couldn't plan on it. Oh my gosh, it was torture. I do. I and remember. They, how about stupid as this? <laughs> the the first game they put a brace on it, a plastic brace, and taped it. And I'm playing during it. We're playing the Rams. Kevin Green is just killing me because <laughs> I I really can't move much, and uh, my knee starts hurting. Oh yeah. Because my ankle's not moving. Right. And I made it through the game. I said, man, this, this is not going to work. <laughs> Kevin Green hit me one time. He hit me so many times a day. He hit me. He goes, man, sorry, Phil. And I swear to you, I said to you, hey, Kevin, I don't give a crap. I'm playing terrible anyway. Who cares? <laughs> yeah, they, they blew you out that day. I remember that, right? They blew you guys out like 45-24 that day. Uh, yeah, they beat us pretty well. I, that's for sure. Uh, I can't remember the score. I just remember... You know, I don't remember the game well because I was dealing. All I could think of was my ankle the whole game. Yeah, so, thirty-one so. ten, and I can still remember it because Jim Everett. That was back in the day when Jim the fans Everett. were too loud. Yeah, he would turn around and he asked the refs to tell the fans to be quiet. And what happened? And they would. And no. they said they yeah. They used to get on the. They got on the. the like it was a the, tennis match. They got on the radio, and I, I want to say it was Jerry Markbright back in the day. That basically said, if the fans don't quiet down, it'll be a 15-yard penalty. That's what they you used yeah, to be able to pull that crap days. off. Wow. Can you believe yeah. that? No. Oh, I know. It's shocking. Yeah. It, it was nice of Kevin Green to apologize to your dad, though. <laughs> yeah. I like oh, that yeah, No, he was funny. You know, Kevin Green probably was one of those guys, not to go into this back stuff, but when he hit you, it hurt more than anything because it was like he was edgy, like it was like he had... You know, sharp bones yeah. or something. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Well, he wasn't hurt. real and big too, right? So he can like get underneath you a little bit. Oh yeah, and he was, you know, he was a, he was built with barbed wire. You know, he's right. one of those guys. He is. And you see Kevin Green today, and you'd go, man, yeah. you have to be like ninety five percent in the end of throw. I mean, he's just got to be. <laughs> his, his bone structure and everything about him, and of course he was crazy too. So it was awesome. Yeah, yeah. he is. He's he, awesome. He's he a great guy. Great guy. So what's going on? I heard y'all doing the trivia thing. Any anything about football? We're gonna do trivia. No, day. no. I mean, we've been doing a lot of football. <laughs> all right. So I mean, I, I guess there's a few things we haven't talked to you in a while. Um, but I the, know. Well, you you cut me off the list. That's okay. I've been cut off a lot of lists. So. <laughs> no, you never cut off the list here. Um, but right. I know you and I talked a little earlier, and you wanted to hit on Pittsburgh and Baltimore a little bit. And I don't Just know. Just a you, little bit. Yeah, I don't know yeah. if you wanted the specific game or the teams, but like, let's start off there. Go ahead. Well, I think the teams, you know, you look at the Pittsburgh Steelers, what makes them, why would you pick them over the Baltimore Ravens in the long run? Just because I think they have more ways to win games than Baltimore does. Uh, right, okay. And, that's, and I think that's really on the defense and offensive side. Yeah. Um, you know, the defense is fast, faster than Baltimore's, you know, but, uh, not the, but you know, they can do so many things. On the offensive side, we saw it. Yeah. They, they played one way in the first half, and they said, well, the hell with that. Let's do a different and they spread it out, and just it was, 
you know, a great job by them in that respect. And I know, and and I've watched the I've watched the game since Sunday. I mean, Baltimore dominated in a lot of aspects and yeah. had every chance in the world to win the game. Of course, right? But they made those mistakes. And my last thing, I'll make them quick, <laughs> is Lamar Jackson. Everybody, oh Lamar, Lamar, Lamar. Be quiet, okay? There's going to be a transition for him. Did you think there was not going to be? Um, the fact that, yeah, the running's going to cut down as he goes in his career just because it's, it's you know, too risky. But the passing will get better with time. Yeah. You know, he wasn't a, a drop-back pocket quarterback in college like Joe Burrow, Justin Herbert. You know, you just go through the names or whatever. He did it a different way, so he's going to make adjustments. And, you know, I'm one of these. I see the improvement yeah. in his throwing down the field. Everybody, right. Oh, down the field, give me the number. Shut up. I don't care. You know, I just don't care. I, I see it from a physical standpoint. And and I think, Paul, Christopher, you're going to agree with this. they got to start, as he's developing, they got to develop plays. Definitely. I mean, how many times do you see him on third and two get in a formation and just get a pick, get a rub, whatever you want to call it, and just throw it out in the flat or anything? Yeah. I yeah. don't know if I've ever seen it. Right. What would you like I, you to know, see him so, incorporate there, Phil, to, to help him kind of take that, that next step? You have to. You have to have so many plays for all situations and everything to keep people off balance. And, and, and of course, nothing against the coaching staff because they're making a transition too. Right. So I, I just think it's interesting uh, the, that we're just jumping on it too quick. Let's yeah. give him time. Let's see what it does. I know they're trying. He's – you know, made some mistakes, and and of course he's not going to be great in the pocket and feeling it because he's always had his whole life, even last year's MVP, to well, I'll just run, right? And that was the great outlet, and that's not quite working quite the same way. And their running game has changed quite a bit too from last year, that's for sure. Yeah, but I I, I think I would echo the same points too. It, it, it's you know, Lamar Jackson has it been perfect? No, I think when you talk about okay, yeah, like. Baltimore, can the pass game carry them? That When we talk about it, I think so many people take that comment and think it's all on Lamar. Mm. And it's not. It's not. I think Dad is right. And I, you know, I know I said this earlier in the week, too. There's got to be more diversity in their pass game and their concepts, too. You know, to where, yeah, there's got to be a little bit more answers for, oh, they're playing this this way, here's our package of plays for that. Oh, they're playing this coverage now, here's our package of plays for that. There's, there's not enough of that always, and I think that you know kind of hinders Lamar Jackson to a degree, yeah, too. Here's what it is, too, Christopher. Yeah. They're running the plays they ran last year, but it was out of all the running formations, and he would make the fake, and, you know, you're stuck. Right. You had to come up and at least play run. Well, they're running those same plays, but now he's catching it and dropping straight back. Yeah. So, right. you know, linebackers, whatever, everybody's on alert quicker, and they, they, they defended some of them. He's hit a lot of them still, uh, but... You know, I, I think you learn. And there's, there's, only one, there's only one way to learn to play from the pocket and do what we're saying, and that's to do it. Yeah. So I'm, I, I'm willing to give it time. You know, I'm not. It's, it's not. Well, I'm just not as crazy. And here's the other thing that everybody's beating to death. I won't go into detail. Oh well, he hasn't won the games that counted. Oh, okay. Here we go. The games that count. Uh, you know, he lost three times at Kansas City. Oh my gosh, that's embarrassing. How could you lose to Kansas City three times? <laughs> he lost to Tennessee in a playoff game. Yeah, Tennessee had a rolling. You know, they really did. They were yeah. the team that just it all fell together. You know, right now it looks like it's falling apart a little bit on their defensive side. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I hear those things, and I'm just going to leave it at that. Try to watch the show this Sunday, and um, I'm just going to show you something. You're going to go, oh, well, yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, right. yeah. this big game crap I always hear. Oh, the, well, you know, he's won 28 in a row, but the game that counts yeah. is this one. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's bull crap, Dad. You're, you're exactly right. I, I don't know if you saw the show this morning. I kind of said the same thing. I mean, I'm pretty sure Seattle at Seattle last year was a pretty big game. Right. 49ers yeah. came to Baltimore. Yeah. Pretty big game. Yeah. Tom Brady and the undefeated Patriots came to Baltimore. That matters, pretty big yeah. game. Yeah. They won. Oh, those don't count. I know. It's the so, ones that we really yes, so, yes, I know. Yeah, I, I get defeats, you. you know, never let the facts get in the way exactly. of the story. Big Phil, I, I, I like yeah. that tease for Sunday's show because now, in addition to watching to see how much better your suit-tie combo is than Boomer's, 
I can, I, I can look forward to what you're going to do with Lamar. I want to talk about the other quarterback in that game, uh, Ben Roethlisberger, because yes. you, you're somebody, you, you had a lot of success in your 20s, but you found a way to have a lot of success in your 30s playing quarterback as well. With that sure. in mind, with that experience in mind, what do you think of the way he's playing and running that offense? You know, I, I think he's doing a great job. I really do. He's just got, he has got, it's like he took a Valium before the game, and I'm just going to relax. Yeah, seriously. I'm going to throw that ball. Yeah. And it is so smooth, it is ridiculous. It really is. I, I've watched him every week, and I'd watched him today to study the Baltimore game, and I just go, man, you know, Paul, you're an ex-quarterback, Christopher. He leans back on that back foot and just rolls into that throw, and he's throwing out cuts like they're, you know, screen passes. It's no big deal. Yeah, and, yeah. and then the other thing he does, the short, he can get it out of his hand quick for all their cute little formations and plays right. that Baltimore took away. But they are going to lie. I think he threw, gosh, I wrote it down in my notes, um, but I don't know how many where he just dropped back, he picked out the one-on-one and just threw that thing straight right. up in the air and down the field. And they're good, I would say, probably an over. I say they're good for almost five of those a game. Yeah. And, you know, that is something, it's so amazing. From Cower to Mike Tomlin, there's so many philosophies they do on offense now that are so similar from the day Ron Earhart was the coach. Right. With the offensive coordinator down there. Yeah. They still run the same system, I think. Hmm. And so many of the same plays, you know, they got new. Todd Haley, he, he ran it too. But throw out cuts on one-on-one and then make sure you – you know, throw the footballs down the field, do it early. And I think they had two big pass interferences. They did. If I'm not mistaken. I think it was three, too, so. actually. Yeah, that, that was big. Was it three? Yeah. Well, there, there you go. And, and and when he throws them, you watch it, you go, well, there's no chance this is going to be intercepted. It's just the question, will his guy catch it in stride, uh, get pass interference, or just, you know, go up and take it away from somebody? So it's, it's a great combination. So that's when I go back to all the ways they can win, and it just – they can adapt and they can yeah. change, and that's what you got to have in the NFL. Yeah, you, you know, we would play a team, and I know you did all. We all did the same thing at every level, but we would play a team if we rushed the ball against the Washington football team the first time of the season. It was a guarantee our game plan was going to be to air it out in game two. Right. We would never go into oh it worked last time and it worked this. No, what do you think they're trying to stop this right. week? Right. Right. So, and you know, I that was the one thing about Parcells. Uh, Coach Parcells. I didn't mean to say Parcells. But, you know, he knew what the other team was working on, and he wasn't afraid to go from whatever, you know, shooting three-pointers to layups. Right. He, he really could be that drastic, so it's it pretty cool to watch Pittsburgh do it. Yeah, definitely. And it's funny you brought that up because we were just talking about the lost art of, like, offenses don't throw out routes and comebacks right. and one-on-ones outside anymore, and we were talking about that a little with Russell Wilson and D.K. Metcalf. Uh, it's like a lost art in the NFL. All right. Oh. Yeah. Yes, it, it, it is. You know why? Because, you know, the coordinator, for some reason, is afraid. Yeah, he is. Oh, exactly right. one-on-one to the corner. Oh, right. you know, yeah, it is a lost art, and, you know, you can only get good at that and get really good at it like the Steelers because they've never stopped doing it. So go ahead. All right. Well, young QBs, because we really haven't talked about that since, you know, we haven't had you on in a while. But I know right. that's something you wanted to hit on. I don't know if it's Burrow, Herbert, whatever, but go ahead. Well, the floor is yours. Okay. All of them. You know, I think Joe Burrow, um, he's everything that he showed at uh, LSU, but probably more. I think I'm more impressed with him now than I was in his season at LSU. Yeah. Because he's going against NFL people. You said a great word today that was just described. He's slippery. I mean, he just, he's got enough size, quickness, and speed right. where he can break those arm tackles and pull his way through the, you know, some of those yeah. big D linemen. And his throwing, his anticipation, is it's tremendous. Right. And his how quick he makes decisions. And I thought your point about you know getting rid of the football even faster this past week was great because I, when they played Baltimore Ravens, man, I, I was hot under the collar. I know the you following were. week, right? You know, my God, don't subject the guy to just getting. Let's get him through the year. Yeah. But they made good adjustments. And I don't, I don't know what else to say. It's A plus in everything. Mm, yeah. And even his arm strength, which I thought, you know, his arm is, you know, it's just a solid NFL arm. 
uh, I swear, I think he's throwing the ball harder now and with more mm-hmm. power than he did at LSU. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's caught my eye there for sure. How about Herbert? And, well, Herbert, you, you know, Paul, I don't know how you felt about him before the draft. Liked him. But yeah. I, I had a guy from Miami say to me, they interviewed 50 guys. Or, you know, just put the number out there. Because that's all they talked about last off season, And I'm not going to give all the names, but two of them are me and Christopher. That the guys they interviewed, we were the only two that talked positive about Justin Herbert. Yeah. And I don't mean to take credit that way or anything. I'm not. Who knows how his career is going to go. But I go, how can you not like him? He's tall, plays really tall. He's got a really good arm. I thought he was accurate with the football, mm-hmm. controls it. He's one of the few quarterbacks that I've seen, even in the NFL, that can stand there with everybody around him and still throw over the top of the defense. Right. He's not looking in between the guard and center. Yeah. He's looking over them. Yeah, you're and, right. And it shows. There's not a lot of them in the NFL right now. No, no, there's not. And it's and he can do it, and he has a way of doing it all without really taking these big smashing hits. Right, and, yeah. You know, and last week, you know, just so many good throws every single game. Every that week. You just can't really deny it. And and it's kind of nice to see everybody going, hey, oh, Justin Herbert, he's pretty good. Right. Caught me by surprise. Uh, I don't know. You know, so that that's... It I is something how it was, those, it was the popular way, Phil, last spring to to knock the kid more than it was to be excited about his physical potential. Well, yeah, it really was. And, it, you know, and I said this, I, and I really mean it this year, I won't talk to one person about the draft before and all that. I don't want to hear anybody's opinion, <laughs> nothing, because they call you and you hear it so much. You, it's like, Christopher, I've heard you say it. Yeah. You just go, well, what the hell am I missing? That's here? what happened <laughs> with me and Lamar Jackson. I mean, yeah. you know, Dad, Dad said that to me before. He goes, because hey, he, he, Dad brought it up. He goes, yeah, I understand. He goes, I go through it, too. You know, I had Lamar yeah. Jackson. I, he's number one quarterback. He's number one quarterback. He's number one quarterback. But all Dad and I got, and I especially, and then we went. I went to the owners' meetings to do PFT there. All I got was really Lamar Jackson, the number one quarterback. Yeah. Really, really, really. And I started to go, well, "Damn, did they know? So, is what am is I he missing? messed up in meeting rooms? Right. Is it? You know, what is it?" So I started getting off the bandwagon. I had people I really trust who were attacking me, and I'm I'm mad. Because the owners' yeah, meetings right. owners yeah, meetings were canceled right. this year, I wanted to give it yeah. to everybody a little bit this year. Right? Yeah. 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 Well, you know what? You should. I will. And, and because hey, they just sitting around waiting for it to go wrong, and they say, "Well, we knew this was coming." Now that's always the great one. You know, they just wait long enough, and of course, it falls apart for everybody in the league. Right. You know, Justin Herbert. Oh well, they've only won one game. Well, mm. okay. It, 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 now, are you watching the games? <laughs> Is it his fault they lose it? No. 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 I mean, he, oh, they get all these leads and they can't hold on. Oh, that's Justin Herbert's fault. He's got to <laughs> right. go over and get a sack. Get a, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, you know, I just, it, you know, everybody laughs at me at CBS. He goes, man, you get all worked up because you watch everybody during the week. Well, I'm sitting here watching games on video, so I listen to the TV, and I just sometimes have to stop it and go, that was so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there's nothing I can do about it except just, okay. That's, but here's why it bothers me. Why does it bother you, Christopher and Paul? Why do y'all get bothered by some of these assumptions and people make comments that you just go, that's absurd and that's wrong, whatever? I, I would say as it relates to, to Herbert, what bothers me is it's so easy to get in the minutia of things that some a, a kid doesn't have or reasons to doubt that you get away from what your eyes tell you and that Justin Herbert made every throw look easy. Physically, he's as gifted as anybody and threw a pretty ball. Like, Don't let it take us away from what we're seeing and what, what you're starting with, what this giant cool. ball of clay yeah. has. And all of the potential criticisms can get you away from what you saw the first time, which was, wow, he makes every single throw look pretty easy. Well, yeah, we got, we got too many bottom line readers that, that evaluate the sport sometimes, or they just go, wait, well, are they lost? Oh, wait, you know, his stats were that. He has to be the reason they lost. That's it. Or oh, didn't win the big game. They didn't win the yeah. big oh, game. Went to right. Oregon. They didn't win the big game. His yeah. stats weren't always great. Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, Dad, well, here, we could have sat you down and watched five games and go. There hasn't been five people open in five games. Right. So what do you want them to do? Right. Yeah. Well, you know, listen, here's my thing is, because when people get into these, all this stuff, and the 
they go overboard with their evaluation or whatever, and they don't show the, whatever, that it becomes the narrative, and you cannot overcome it. You, you, you know, know, so that it's out there, and whoever it is, Lamar, you know, okay, he shut that down pretty quick. But for <laughs> other quarterbacks, Justin Herbert, the narrative is there. Now people haven't jumped on it, but I'm sure they're kind of waiting because you know, no, it, it's just, it's just interesting. Just just like the people that went overboard about certain other young quarterbacks, mm-hmm. and well, there's a reason why it's not working. It's not their fault. Oh yes, oh of course. But if it was one you didn't rate high, you'd be all over his ass. Yeah, right. right so right, right. You, you know, is it right? It's it's wrong because it it's you can't overcome narrative sometimes in this league. And I just watched a segment on ESPN, and all they did was quarterbacks. And fine, that's great. But it was like killing some, and others. I go, oh my gosh. What are they? What are they talking about? It, it's and 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 you know too. I did an interview this week. This is like therapy for me. <laughs> uh, but I did an interview. No, it was last week. And I said, "Why do you make everything about the quarterback and the head coach?" My God! Right. And of course, you know the answer. Because well, I get the I, most I, clicks. That's the only click because right. I get more clicks, and right. I got to keep my job. And I go, you know what? Okay, man, I understand. That's that's the way it goes. Yeah. But. That's what it is, and it's it really goes hardly no farther than the damn coach and quarterback now, which, hey, maybe that's why the quarterbacks need, uh, okay, they deserve the money because they're going to take all the blame <laughs> when it course. doesn't work, that's for sure. Phil, we're going to end you right here. As promised, y- your son got three of the first four QB Jeopardy questions, which is all about either Notre Dame or Clemson for the, for the game this weekend. Are you ready for this 500 points? Me? Yeah, yeah you're in this. Yes. Let's go, big guy. Okay, go ahead. Shoot it at me. Okay. Tiger running back, Travis Etienne, just became the ACC all-time leading rusher. He's a two-time ACC player of the year. Who was the last Clemson player to win that award twice? And here's the big hints. He played quarterback, and in 1979 was the next quarterback taken after Big Phil in the first round. Steve Fuller. Wow. He wins. I would never one for get one. That retired. Man, that, you can't ask him that. He's the same draft Kansas pass. City That's Chief. too easy. <laughs> He's sixty four. Right, Clark was his wide receiver. Ago. Yep. Yeah. All right. Yep. Well, good so, job, Christopher. You're not the only one that can answer a question, right? <laughs> <laughs> good job. Well, I got it from. Somebody. All right. You guys have a great day. All right, Dad. See you, man. Phil. Okay. See you, man. Thank you, Paul. All right. See you, Phil. I thought for sure he could still throw sixty five. <laughs> he could probably pump it out there fifty. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he could do that, and you know. It's just, it's old. The elasticity in the arm is still, it's not there anymore. Now, if you threw oh. like 15 or 20 yards from him, yeah. he could still oh, hum it in there. Yeah. Like to make you believe he could throw it 60 yards that way. Right. But he can't get his back and shoulder pointed upward to trajectory anymore to get the ball to go up. He's too old. One right. of these times, we, we actually have to get out on Chelsea Pierce and throw the ball. Yeah, you're right. We do. Create some kind of, yes. you know, fling it around. Right. Hopefully nobody gets hurt. Yep. Okay, we have one more game to get to. Yeah, let's do it. On the what? happen. Mm-hmm. Buccaneers knock off the Giants 25-23. Daniel Jones, uh, especially out here in this part of the country, a kind of a lightning rod for conversation right yep. now. More encouraged by his touchdowns or discouraged by those two really bad INT? Yeah, I'm discouraged. Uh, the game itself, I'm discouraged more. And a guy, you know, again, just to frame it up, I didn't like Daniel Jones coming out in the draft. He's proved me wrong, and I've been a big defender of him ever since. I really am. And, of course, you know I'm a Giants fan, so I'm rooting for him. But that was an ugly game. You know, the interceptions, yes. But I'll tell you what also pisses me off, just, you know, as far as the Giants fan, the four missed wide-open deep throws. Yeah. I mean, those were big. Those were points that never came about. It wasn't like he missed the deep throw and, oh, they still went down the field and scored the touchdown. You know, that's when you can, like, live with it. But these were like, oh, and then they had a punt a few plays later. And that was like, whoa, that was an opportunity to really put the Bucks in a tough spot here. So I was disappointed with that, let alone the interceptions. Yes, I mean, Joe Judge managed the game perfectly. They did so many good things to where it was there to be had. They caught the Bucks on an off night, kind of sleepwalking. And they were trying to let the Giants win the football game. And the Giants screwed it up, really. I mean, you know, 
hey, it was a good game plan. They ran the ball well. They were patient with that. They weren't going to let the Bucks ruin the game. You know, Jason Garrett had a good game plan of a lot of two tight end sets. Teams, why did he go to two tight end sets? Because he knows Todd Bowles brings nine zillion different creative blitzes, and he gets in those two tight end sets. That makes Todd Bowles go, wait, they can run it. They could spread out. I don't know what to do. Let's play more vanilla, right? So he did that. I thought that was very smart. You know, the running game, even though it wasn't big numbers, it was successful enough to where, like, yeah, we got to worry about it. we got to defend it. And Daniel Jones did some good things, certainly. But, I mean, the first interception. Both interceptions were just both disastrous. Both are bad. Disastrous. Yeah. The first one, it is, what, 14 to 6, right? It's 14 to 6. Yep. And... They're, you know, dancing around midfield. It's trips right. There's three receivers to the right. They play for the blitz. They call a maximum protection. The tight end stays in the block. They have a six-man pass protection. The Bucks bring the blitz. Mm -hmm. Jason Garrett's got it. He's called the right play. They're screwed. They call double slant and go on the outside. And then they just have... Um, uh, Golden Tate running a post up the middle. That's all they got. It's three-man route. Everybody mm -hmm. else is in blocking. Set Hut gets the ball. Safety goes way to his right. And he looked left. He looked left. He did, he did look where the wide open receiver was. And yeah. he got off it so quickly, he never gave it a chance to look at it. Yeah. I don't know what he did. He, the, the guy, Slayton, who for everyone out there, is wide open. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a walk-in touchdown. He's behind the DB by, what, 15 yards yes. at least. The DB didn't even make a move. He was stuck. And Daniel Jones looked over there, and before Darius Slayton even came out of his break for the, the go part of it, he already looked the other way. And I just went, well, wait, it's a slant go. you got to yeah. let the guy bite on the slant, and mm -hmm. then you got to see if the go's there. He didn't do that. And then he goes to the other side, and the safety's way over there because they were playing like a trap coverage blitz where it looked like it was three deep, but now it's playing to cover two to his right. And now he's looking over there. Okay, I got pressure. And he's got somebody hanging on him. And he's going to try to throw a ball as somebody's hanging on him up and over Carlton Davis, who's 12 yards down the field. Right. And his receiver's only three yards behind him on the sidelines. Mm-hmm. So all of it was bad. Yeah, I, I don't. And that—that's just man, that hurt me. And, and hurt in me. comparison to, we, we talked about Joe Burrow a little bit ago, and he had a couple of very good plays where he was initially in the pocket uh, in a moment of almost panic, certainly unsure, a little frenetic, and he reset and in that moment found somebody to throw it to. Right. So the almost panic or the panic moment didn't lead to an incompletion or interception with Burrow, and you walk that up to, to Daniel Jones, and in a way it's not fair. Different game, different no, situation. But but there's still too It is fair. There's still too much of it. It was the moment of, I don't really know what to do. Right. One found a way to do something positive, and Daniel Jones threw up for grabs. That, that, that's exactly it. And to let alone, this is a reoccurring theme with Daniel Jones. You know, Hey, listen, again, yeah, should they have won against the Eagles two weeks ago? Evan Ingram should have caught that ball. It was a great throw by him. But then the strip sack fumble at the end of the game, you know, again, it, the pocket awareness for Daniel Jones, it's no longer like I can give you, oh, it's a rookie, he'll learn this. It's, okay, now we've gotten eight games in, and it's still every bit as big of an issue as it was last year. And roll that thought into a second pick. Yeah, so then you get into the second pick. Here we go. They're in, again, the power position. So the first interception is 14-6, and we're driving the ball. Oh, my gosh, Brady and the Bucks are in trouble against yeah. our crappy Giants. <laughs> now it's 17-15, and guess what? We're driving the ball, and we're in field goal range almost. I mean, we're yards away from it. Right. And Thanks to a great return. A great return. Yeah, wasted right. it, yep. And now, okay, so let me just make sure I got this right. You know, he gets into, I'm trying to figure this out. Hold on, I lost my place in my notes. Okay, here we go. <laughs> same, so same type of thing, though, here, to where now he drops back. Nobody's open. He gets a little pass rush, and now he's got to escape to his right. And, like, it's over. The play's over. Yep. Just take the sack. Go down. Whatever. It's second down. Yeah. Who cares? Throw it out of bounds. It's second and five, I believe. But, yeah, or throw it out of bounds. But 
like leaves the pocket, but not like forcefully leaving the pocket, kind of left it and still stayed there. But now, okay, now somebody's grabbing your shoulder. Go down, throw it away. Maybe he was trying to throw it away. Maybe I wrote in my notes, but I don't really think he was. I think, I think so. he was still trying to, ooh, he's on me, mm -hmm. and I think I can hit Golden Tate on this route. Yeah. And, of course, somebody's dragging on him, and he throws the ball way behind the receiver, and that was that. And, of course, that put them in a really tough spot. You seem almost hurt by, by his I, decision. <laughs> I, I am a little bit. There's no doubt about it. I yeah. mean, I really am. Just because it was there to be had. Yeah. The game was there to be had. It mm -hmm. really was. And uh, that's where I just am like, oh, man, you know, they could have pulled off the upset and it could have been a whole different story. And I know, I know there was one other thing I wanted to see about that play that I'm still missing here. Is and, this the uh, second you know, interception? Yeah, you know, yeah, it's the second interception. Okay. I got to go to it here. Good. I think I missed it either way. Forget it. Okay. We're good. Let's go to Brady. Yeah, let's go to Brady. A to F. How yeah. do you grade his performance? Um, Oh, I would give his performance. I'm going to write one down here too. Yeah, I I'd, 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 I'd give it. I'd probably give it an A. You go A. I would. I don't think anything. You know, nothing about his performance. I looked at and went, "Oh, that was a Brady problem yeah. or a Brady issue." Right. They were a little off altogether as an offense the whole night. You know, did he have a few throws? Like there was a deep corner route to t Mike Evans down the left sideline. Yeah, okay, he's Tom he Brady. Weren't many but there missed. wasn't many he missed. So in rhythm, didn't he? Yeah, so yeah. in rhythm, threw the ball perfect. I think some of the ones he did miss were probably more route issues. You know, he missed J.D. Mick, Jaden, uh, Mickens down the middle one time on a deep crossing route. I think the game was at 7-3 at that point. Okay. You know, and Mickens didn't keep running. And if you watch the game on TV, Brady is, throws the ball, and you can read his lips as he goes, Run! <laughs> and for some reason, he slowed down. So right. they had a few little mistakes like that throughout the game that just those two where I go, ooh, he hits those, or the guy runs the route the right way, this game is going to be different. But either way, the Giants, who are an outman football team, had a good game plan yeah. and did a lot of good things in the football game to you know, make life hard on Brady and company. But still, it's four games in a row now, no picks for Tom. No, I mean, Brady is, they got it. They really do. You know, I, I think the way they dropped the ball a little bit on the offensive side of the ball in this football game is the second and third quarter, they got away from the run a little bit. And not that they need to run a little lot more, but they got a little shotgun happy and, oh, they're not a good secondary and we'll throw the ball on them. And that took the aspect of what I think they're best at is, and what he's killing it right now is, their play action passes. You know, on their game winning drive, to go down and score, or to score the touchdown, yes, to get them to 23, excuse me, not the game, because I know they get the field goal after that. They get to 22, you know, the play action pass came back, and even the last field goal drive, it came back a little bit to help them out that way. So uh, that's the only negative I have. The Giants, though, you know, Patrick Graham, you know, he's a really good defensive coordinator. He's a rising star in the league. And the other thing that really helped them out in the matchup itself, Paul, is just that they have so many big people up front. Mm -hmm. It allowed them to play a lot of shell coverages, a lot of two deep and four deep, and never have to take a chance of going, we're one-on-one -on -one against your great receivers or weapons. And that's one luxury the Giants have because they have a lot of big people up front that they can kind of just go, no, front four or front five, you guys handle the run. We need to worry about these corners back here, and we got to help them out. That's a podcast with four deep dives, a little bit of QB Jeopardy, and a lot of big fill. Bam. There it is. We did it. Yeah. We did it. Yep, and uh, I think we hit it all. And I still don't know why D Daniel Jones didn't throw the two-point conversion pass quicker. That's that would right. be the last thing I'd Just hit on hair, the way out. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what he did. It was there. Throw it. Throw it right it's now. It's too late. Yep. But hope everybody enjoyed the podcast. That was a What the F Happened edition on a Wednesday. Tomorrow is the PFT PM Chris Sims on Button joint collaboration Mega Picks podcast. Just an okay week of picks last week. All right? All right. But I still gave a lot of damn good info. Uh, Polly. Joint collaboration. Joint collaboration. Nice. Yes, yeah. I like the word joint. Good to see you okay. twice. This Good week. to see you twice as well. You'll yeah. be back next week at some point, right? Uh, Pete, I hope so. Pete. Yeah, All right, says yes, good, yes. good, We're good, back. good. We'll be we'll back. Paul E. Baymeister will be back. Peace out, everybody. Check out our podcast on Thursday, Picks Podcast. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.